to Transportation Chain, a series focused on how current events are impacting transportation, trucking, and supply chain management. My name is Becky Schultz, and I'll be your host for this episode. Our series opens with a look at the current disruptions stemming from the COVID-19 pandemic and how this is affecting the movement of goods, equipment, and materials across the country. In this episode, my colleague Sarah Jensen, editor of OEM Off Highway Magazine, and I will discuss how supply chain disruptions are affecting two key essential industries, construction and equipment manufacturing. We'll also hear from Kurt Benink, Senior Field Editor at Equipment Today, who will share insights on what companies transporting construction materials and equipment are encountering as a result of restrictions put in place during the pandemic. But first up is Marina Mayer, Editor-in-Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive Magazines, who will share insights on what she's seeing and hearing from representatives in the supply and logistics segments. Let's check in with Marina now. Hello, my name is Marina Mayer. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive. And I'm here with John Eisen, our Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the International Food Service Distributors Association. So hello, John. Marina, glad to be with you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. So one of the things we wanted to talk about today was the food service industry. You know, nationwide, it has suffered, you know, as a result of the state-home orders, it's, it's, it's kind of suffering. But... IFTA has been doing a fabulous job of of implementing and creating some advocacy initiatives, some stimulus packages. Kind of wanted to see, you know, what's kind of out there that is is being put together to help get America's restaurants up and running. Sure. Well, happy to be here today. And and you're, of course, correct. The industry is is having a very difficult time. Most of our members are seeing significant declines in business, obviously, with Many of their customers being closed for shutdown orders, uh, such as colleges and universities or K-12, or serving very, very limited menus of, of takeout items. Um, so it's obviously been a challenge. Distributors are uh, finding ways forward as best they can. And um, thank you for the kind words about our efforts at IFTA. Um, from my perspective, we work on the, the advocacy side, and I think that uh, we have seen some significant developments from government that uh, certainly have at least provided some funding so far um, to help bridge this gap. Uh, and then, uh, that's from the congressional side. And then really on the regulatory side, we've seen a lot of efforts underway by the various uh, government agencies to relax some of their rules, provide additional flexibility, uh, and make it easier for distributors to operate in ways that they might not ordinarily do so. On the legislative side, the, the passage of the CARES Act uh, about three weeks ago was really the biggest uh, single piece of legislation we've seen. It has the Paycheck Protection Program, as you're probably aware, uh, which provides uh, loans, forgivable loans for businesses with 500 people, uh, 500 or fewer employees. Uh, I know that many distributors have taken advantage of this funding, and certainly for operators, uh, it is a critical lifeline, provides uh, loans of up to two and a half times the average monthly payroll, which will be completely forgivable if used in certain conditions. And so there was an initial allocation of $350 billion, and they went through that in about a week and a half. Congress today is going to pass an additional $310 billion to provide additional funding for that program. There are also a a, a number of tax breaks included in the legislation that the distributors and their customers might be able to uh, use. And then for larger distributors, there will be two different programs at Treasury. They're taking, unfortunately, a little bit longer to set up than we would like a Main Street lending facility, which will be for employers 500 to 10,000. It will provide uh, loans through banks uh, from the Federal Reserve. We've provided comments on that at IFTA. Um, and hopefully we will see that up and running in the next week. Uh, we're a little disappointed that it's taken this long, but hopefully we'll see that shortly. And then there will be a larger business program for employers with above 10,000 people, but that is well behind in the time frame, unfortunately. So we're, we're hoping to see that set up within the next few weeks, I suppose. And then as we look forward, we do expect additional legislation, whether it's providing additional funding, uh, changing some of the rules of the Paycheck Program, for instance, uh, increasing the allowable uses for that money to allow uh, customers, for instance, to pay suppliers for their 
for the products that they need to reopen and, and making that a forgivable use of the money as well. So we will be working with Congress as they return. They return NAIF to Washington on May 4th. And as they begin the next set of uh, legislation, we'll be working on that. On the regulatory side, we've been very active with a number of agencies all across the government, whether it's FDA, uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, uh, Homeland Security, FEMA, the entire alphabet soup of the federal government. And they have all been very, very responsive in attempting to remove any barriers to commerce that they may be creating the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and media uh, very quickly upon the beginning of this crisis suspended some of the hours of service rules, for instance, for companies making emergency deliveries or things like that. FDA and USDA both waived some of the rules around uh, labeling requirements for selling food service product into retail, which some of our members have been doing and doing with some success, but obviously food service product is not labeled as a retail product would be. So they have made, they've relaxed those rules. USDA is, is right now rolling out a plan to, to buy uh, dairy and meat and, and produce and have it assembled into boxes and then sell it and then deliver it, have food service distributors deliver it to uh, food banks across the country, which as I'm sure you've been seeing have been, have been very much in demand lately. So uh, there's a whole wide variety of efforts underway to, I think, influence them and, and, and do what we could to make sure that food service distributors' concerns are heard throughout every level of government. Well, and you bring up a good point about, you know, the food service items going into retail because, you know, we see a lot of it where food service um, distributors have had to pivot to direct-to-consumer. So there's kind of many different arms and legs to how they need to rethink doing business at this present time. What kind of other things do they, do they need to think of with making decisions like this? Obviously, these companies, you know, for direct-to-consumer have to put some kind of a order online portal on their website, things that they've never really done before. Can you kind of explain some of the opportunities that that have been built as a result of all this? Sure. You know, certainly we've seen a lot of very creative thinking um, from many of our members and you know, they're doing a great deal of work to to find ways to get to consumers and help consumers. You know, many of them did have cash and carry operations prior to this and, and they are, um, I think, increasing those operations. Many of them certainly are now considering opening their warehouses. Uh, they didn't have a cash and carry prior to that. What we've heard a lot of is, is distributors allow, opening up their online portals to, so you can order online and then they will distribute to, or, or bring a truck to a neighborhood community center or something like that, and you can, and they will deliver your order. Uh, you can come pick up your order there. We're seeing a lot of that type of movement. But, you know, we're seeing, you know, companies are working with grocery to provide workers and transportation capacity uh, to assist the retail industry as well. So, you know, really across the board, we're seeing a lot of very creative ways um, to reach consumers, to help the retail industry, to find ways to you know, make out to, to find business wherever wherever you can. So for those companies that have, you know, seen some success in these other types of channels, do you foresee some of them continuing into those channels uh, into the future? Unfortunately, I do. I, I think the, uh, the ramp up will once we get the economy started again, is not going to be uniform across the country. And so I do think there's going, you know, distributors will continue to be looking to find other ways to supplement their business because, you know, certainly as we, you know, it's likely that restaurants will not be permitted to open up completely. They'll have to have a much smaller capacity to maintain social distancing and, and things like that as we get going. So um, unfortunately, I think this will be probably a, a slower process than we would like. And, and certainly, yeah, I think without question, distributors will begin to, will continue to look for different ways to promote themselves to whether it's through consumers, through the retail channel, whichever way they possibly can. Well, thank you for all of that. Was there anything, John, that you wanted to add that we haven't covered that you would want to share with our readers? Uh, well, we just we appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on today. Certainly, we are here to help distributors through this time. If there is anything we can do in Washington to assist the industry, that's what we do. There is opportunity. Certainly, government is listening right now to any issues they may face. So if distributors are running into any regulatory hurdles or uh, have any issues in Congress that we can help with, uh, that's what we're here for. Well, I appreciate it. I personally think it has been doing a great job and hopefully everybody continues to support 
through local restaurants and, and restaurants across the nation. So we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and best of luck to all the IFTA members. Hello, this is Marina Mayer, Editor-in-Chief of Food Logistics and Supply and Demand Chain Executive. And I'm here with Lowell Randall. He's the Vice President of Government and Legal Affairs with the Global Cold Chain Association. Hello, Lowell. Hi. Thank you for joining our program today. Thanks. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, And really, uh, it's an interesting time in the industry. So we appreciate the opportunity to to talk about some of the issues that the industry is facing and how, how we're responding. Absolutely. So as, as everybody knows, you know, the coronavirus is top of mind, um, especially in the supply chain and logistics industry. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing is the increased speed to market in a lot of technologies and applications. So, um, you know, how, how professionals are adapting to the new world, um, to the new normal, et cetera. So if you can kind of run through what, what you're seeing from your side of, of the fence. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, it's really been impressive how the food industry has has come together to respond to this challenge. And you know, we we've been working closely with the you know, producers, manufacturers, uh, food service, retail, and of course all of the logistics providers that, that make up the Global Cold Chain Alliance membership. And It's been impressive to see how everybody is focused on maintaining that food supply. And that has resulted in in some innovations and some use of technology. Um, And and that comes in a couple of different ways. So one of them is just in safety of operations and the whole theme of social distancing and and how do we utilize technology effectively to to, uh, better maintain that safe workspace. So one of the examples of utilizing technology comes with how our uh, uh, members are interacting with with drivers so we have driver members we have warehouse members and there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of innovation of how do we minimize the the risks in that contact in that relationship between a driver and a facility and so one of the innovations that we've seen is going paperless um, we've got one member who's actually installed scanners uh, right there where the drivers would come in to, uh, to their facility. And so uh, they can scan the documents uh, and, and then they would be transmitted electronically to the, the warehouse people to get those processed. And they even went one step further and filmed the uh, process uh, and explained what the new steps were to process that electronic document, and they've gotten great feedback from the drivers. Uh, so I think this this gives a little bit more comfort for the drivers because they're they're wanting to protect themselves, and it gives some uh, get, gives some comfort to the the facility people as well in that uh, it's a respectful way to get those documents transmitted uh, and and minimizing that contact in, in some of those uh, potential uh, risks of, of, of spreading the, the virus. So, so that's one example. Another example of, of using technology is just simply in how we're clocking in and out. Uh, so some facilities have the ability to utilize electronic pins. So rather than going and, and you know, touching a, a, a time clock and doing it the traditional way where you've got you know, dozens, if not more people kind of touching that, that piece of equipment, uh, when you get into a certain geofenced area within the facility or near the facility, you can clock in and do that uh, off of your smartphone and, uh, and that's a, a way that people can, can do that and, and minimize some of those touch points. Uh, continuing with social distancing, some of it's pretty low tech. It's um, changing how you configure break rooms, uh, whether that's removing seats at, at a lunch table or blocking things off. Um, and so some of it's low tech, but it's still an important way to reinforce that, uh, that social distancing. Um, as, as we look at kind of other parts of, of innovation, uh, we're seeing some members 
uh, take uh, really uh, neat steps in innovating uh, healthcare for their uh, for their workers by uh, engaging with a company that provides mobile worksite clinics. So uh, again, uh, that's uh, maybe not a food technology, but that is the embracing of innovation technology uh, in the healthcare space uh, where they would have healthcare providers uh, bring a trailer on site to their facility and enable them to uh, do uh, do health screenings and if uh, and and do testing for for a variety of uh, potential illnesses, including COVID nineteen. Uh, so uh, so those are, are a few uh, a few innovations and, and technologies that uh, that we're starting to see people uh, adapt to and, and implement that are specific to some of the unique challenges within the. Uh, uh, within this coronavirus response. Um, there, there are some other technologies uh, or innovations that we're seeing as we start to shift from uh, a lot of demand for food service to more demand for uh, retail. And again, that's not necessarily new technology, but it's how do we adapt and shift? So we're seeing some shift in production lines uh, to uh, uh, take what would normally be a food service oriented product and divert it into a more retail line. I know some of our members are working closely with their customers to say, okay, we can blast freeze this originally intended fresh product that was going to go into a restaurant market and enable that to go into retail. And our members are working on things like relabeling and if there are packaging issues. And so there's a lot of innovation that's ongoing to adapt to some of those shifts in, in production and demand as well. And are you seeing some of your members restructuring lines to maybe um, instead produce you know, medical supplies or any personal protective equipment? What kinds of things are you seeing? Yeah, so in, in the warehousing side of things, uh, you know, they're generally not manufacturing product, but we do have some members who are uh, making masks. So they've uh, you know, gotten patterns and they've uh, you know, identified some of their team members who have that uh, capability and they're making masks uh, for their for their teams, and uh, that's you know it highlights a challenge that we're seeing, and that is the availability of, of personal protect, protective equipment. And that's I think where we're seeing a lot of companies shifting how they are uh, how they're how they're operating. So again, not necessarily a, a warehouse company, but uh, there there are a lot of manufacturers that we know of that maybe. Uh, produced uh, everything from uh, upholstery for car uh, car parts to wow. clothing that are adapting and saying, hey, we are going to step up and respond to this need for face coverings and masks and, uh, and, and convert their production lines there. Another great example, and we're actually partnering with the uh, Distillers Council, is on the diversion of uh, alcohol, alcoholic beverage uh, mm. distillers and turning that into hand sanitizer production. And that's really been a nice partnership uh, between the Global Cold Chain Alliance and, and the distillers. Uh, they have a, uh, an online uh, resource where you can match up and find those local distillers that are now making hand sanitizer and in talking with our members, they've actually been able to work with their local distillers to source some of those, uh, some of that hand sanitizer. And, and I might just also note that uh, we, we really appreciate the guidance that the Department of Homeland Security recently put forward that uh, puts priority access for things like sanitizer. Uh, obviously, healthcare is priority number one, and we we salute the the men and women in the healthcare industry for for all of the heroic work that they're doing. But we're also very proud of the men and women in the food supply chain, and uh, we're we're working hard to make sure that they are recognized for the critical roles that they're playing, so that they have access to things like hand sanitizer, personal protective equipment. And, uh, and, and we've also been very successful in, in getting that national designation as part of the critical infrastructure. And, and that goes for our 
uh, food warehouses, obviously food production, distribution, retail, uh, the truck, uh, the the uh, the trucking companies, and and others in food distribution. So it's been a, a really challenging time, but it's also been a rewarding time to see the recognition of how important our industry is to maintaining that food supply and getting that broad recognition at the highest levels of government. And I, and I could not agree more. I mean, we're, we're seeing, you know, I guess the positive out of all this is just watching the industry do things differently to still get food and supplies through the supply chain to the people that need it when they need it. And it's just been from our vantage point, um, it's just been amazing to see that whole, um, how it all plays out. So with that in mind, um, when all of this is over, do you, how do you project companies to continue doing business? You know, are they going to, do you project them to continue a lot of this technology in place or go back to how things used to be? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I, I think time will tell. We don't really know what the long-term changes will, will be as, as we look at the impacts of, of the pandemic. But I, I do think that there are some trends that we'll, we'll see continue. Um, one, when, when we talked about uh, technology, I didn't mention automation earlier, and that's, that's a technology that has been evolving in, in the food industry for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to continue uh, e even more, not just because of, uh, of the coronavirus, but because we're, we're starting to see that technology really evolve um, and become a little more accessible. Um, and uh, you don't necessarily need to go fully automated to uh, incorporate some elements of automation into your into your facilities. Uh, so I think that's one trend that we're going to continue to see more and more adoption of automation. But when we think about some of the changes specific to to coronavirus, uh, I do think we're always going to be very mindful, at least in, in for, for probably the rest of my lifetime. Uh, be mindful of social distancing and good hand washing and yeah. hygiene. And, and so there will, I think, be some of those things, whether it be uh, clocking in and re uh, remotely or um, you know, utilizing uh, those types of, of technologies that minimize uh, personal, the need for personal contact with, with you know, between a driver and a warehouse person, or mm -hmm. uh, those technologies uh, to reduce those high touch areas so that we we minimize the risk. Because some of those uh, solutions are are low cost, no cost, and and really can be done very efficiently. So I think some of those will 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 persist uh, in the longer term. I think one of the big questions that we really don't know the answer to is what is this balance going to look like between food service and um, and retail and what that demand pattern will be in the next you know, year, two years, five years? Uh, because prior to the pandemic, it was about 50-50 in uh, the average U.S. consumer's uh, food uh, uh, buying between food service and, uh, and retail. And right now that number is, is very, very different. And when we start removing social distancing and commercial restrictions, uh, what does that mean for restaurants and, and other institutional food service? Uh, will we see this resurgence and, and back to this 50-50 type of a split? And if so, how long does that take? Uh, I think we've, we've started to see uh, some some uh, adaptation certainly in in production as uh, as companies are in some cases reducing the number of uh, uh, of, of products that they're manufacturing uh, so fewer SKUs uh, to refill those grocery shelves as as efficiently as possible uh, so uh, do, does does some of those efficiencies uh, continue on and for how much uh, how long a period of time. We don't know. Um, we know that there are some manufacturers and some retailers that are working with our members to say, hey, uh, let's go to full pallet in, full pallet out, 
to help meet this surge in demand at the retail market um, and, and really minimize case pick. And for some of our member customers, that makes perfect sense. And it enables a higher volume of product to move through the facilities in a, in a quicker way. Um, but, you know, in two years, are we going to go back to more intensive case pick? I, I don't, I, I think time will tell. But those are some of the questions that I think will, will need to be looked at as, as we see, um, number one, what, what, how long lasting are these impacts of the coronavirus? And two, what, what is the consumer demand going to look like in, in a couple of years? Uh, so lo lots, of, lots of questions that, uh, that we're taking a look at. We're, we're actually in the process of developing a survey for our members uh, that will look at not only uh, how has the pandemic impacted their operations, but what do they see down the road? Uh, and, and so we should have some information from our members, uh, hopefully in the next several weeks, uh, from that survey to get a better handle on where they think things may be, uh, may be going. And then I would just reiterate, you know, we're continuing to work closely with our, our uh, partners across the food industry. One other partnership I might mention is our work with the food distributors. Obviously, food service has seen a mm -hmm. significant slowing. And that, unfortunately, has, has put a strain on a lot of workers in food service. So we're partnering with the Food Distributors Association, IFTA. Um, and uh, so we're trying to match up local uh, warehouse members of ours who may need some additional workforce with local uh, IFTA members who may be not needing as many people at this moment in time because of a slowdown in their operations to try to, to, to reach out and match, match up those needs. And uh, so we're gonna continue to look for innovative ways where we can partner across the food industry. We're all in this together and, uh, and hopefully we'll come out of it stronger on the, on the other side. Uh, but you, 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 some, some of it time will tell as to how lasting some of these changes will, will be. Right. And I think that if anything, this proves that our supply chains are resilient. The people that work in them are resilient. And, um, you know, we appreciate everything that the GCCA is doing and your members are doing and even IFTA and their members, because like you said, we're all in it together and we as consumers have to keep keep the economy flowing just as well as you, you know, your members have to keep goods moving. So we appreciate everything that you guys are doing. And um, did you have anything else to add to our discussion today? No, I, I would just say again, uh, you know, appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of our experiences and perspectives. Uh, the Global Cold Chain Alliance is, is really taking this uh, response to the pandemic very seriously. So uh, we do have a lot of resources on our web page. So I would uh, just uh, suggest if you're looking for resources and best practices on um, response to, uh, to COVID-19, uh, how, to, uh, how to employ best practices in your food facilities. We've got a lot of resources on our uh, www.gcca.org uh, website. And uh, you know, we, that's uh, free, uh, freely available to members and non-members. So we would encourage you to use that as a central resource uh, and uh, we're all in this together. So let's continue to work, uh, work uh, as one and again, hopefully we'll be stronger on, on the other side of this. Thank you, Marina. In our next segment, Sarah Jensen with OEM Off Highway and I chat about what we're hearing about supply disruptions in the construction and manufacturing sectors. Thank you, Sarah, for joining me in this discussion. So Sarah, to start us off, I'd like to touch on um, what's happening with the movement of materials and equipment across state lines. I'm going to be looking at it specifically from the standpoint of the construction industry and how it's affecting projects across the country. Now, it's interesting because the Associated General Congress did their weekly study and their most recent study of, of conditions for contractors during the COVID-19 pandemic 
indicated that uh, roughly 49% of respondents were saying that they had been notified by a payer or a subcontractor that deliveries of, of material are either going to be, be delayed or halted. But yet, what I'm also hearing is that even with that, that's not necessarily really impacting the ability to get materials and to move materials across the country, or, and especially regionally. And we'll be hearing more about some of the challenges that transportation companies in general are having in that regard later in the episode from Kurt Benning. But it seems like the real problem area are the disruptions that are happening in imported materials coming into the U.S. There, there seems to be more um, challenges in getting certain types of supplies from overseas markets. And to kind of talk us through a little bit of what is going on in the industry, I interviewed Joe Piero, Vice President, Corporate Director of Supply Chain Management at Gilbane Building Company. And that full interview is available as a podcast on forconstructionpros.com. But here's an a little excerpt of uh, what he had to say on this particular subject. You know, we never really worry too much about tile coming from Italy or lighting coming from China or Mexico or glass maybe coming from uh, South America, whatever it might be. Those lead times for the most part were fairly consistent, but now this happens and we have some uh, plants that are shutting down. Some of that um, demand that might have been going to those plants is now redirected, say, to a domestic plant. Need to know how that domestic plant is going to respond. Will they be taking these orders? Uh, do they have the capacity to handle them? I need visibility to uh, terminals, to ports. Did, a CDC, did the CDC come in and shut down a port? Is it temporary? What happens with quarantined containers with that tile sitting in there or that lighting sitting in there? What happens to the motor freight or the rail freight, which is called drayage coming out of those ports? You know, it's a bit of a rock fight, unfortunately, fighting for the capacity on those trucks or those trains because it's not just my industry that's looking for that capacity. It's every industry that's fighting right. for the capacity. Right. Sure. Uh, there are drivers even to operate? Can people unload the vessels and so forth? So um, the change has just been uh, kind of like drinking water through a fire hose. Uh, it has been very, very rapid. Sarah, can you talk now about what you're seeing from the manufacturing perspective? Are you also seeing similar types of things happening in your industry? Yeah, uh, from what we've been kind of seeing and hearing so far is it's, it's a little bit of a mix. Uh, some people are, aren't having issues yet, others are. Um, I kind of recently spoke with the National Fluid Power Association who said they've heard like from a small amount of manufacturers who have noted that they've had some delays and have had some suppliers who are, they've had issues because they're closed or you know, there's just slower delivery times. But then AEM recently released a survey of U.S. equipment manufacturers and found that seven out of 10 executives from these equipment manufacturers have experienced moderately negative impact from the supply chain. And with a quarter of them saying that it's been extremely negative. So it's just at the moment, it seems it's kind of a mixed bag of what they're seeing. And I'm guessing as some of them start to reopen their facilities, they might start to have a little bit more of an issue because the supply chains and various industries are sounding like they are strained. Has there been any indication of where the biggest disruptions are, whether it's on the, the import of materials or whether it's domestic suppliers? The only thing I've heard really about that is when I spoke with the Heavy Duty Manufacturers Association, they mentioned that the uh, shutdown due to COVID in Mexico and the cross-border trade issues with that has caused a lot of disruptions for its members. So that's the really the only one I've heard of so far. I think some of the Europeans have also had a little bit more of an issue just because and anything coming from China it sounds like has been an issue but those that have US based suppliers have had a little easier time from what we've heard so far and that actually plays into um, what I was going to mention next is that interestingly enough we're actually seeing declines in production costs 
this time. I think there's some pretty obvious reasons for that. Ken Simonson, uh, chief economist at the Associated General Contractors of America, again, in their latest survey of members, he, he indicated that 38% of members are reporting projects underway being halted in the month of March. 31% reported cancellations already um, for projects underway in April. So there is definitely a decline in construction activity right now. Mike Bellman, president of uh, and CEO of the Associated Builders and Contractors, he's estimating that uh, the industry is down by as much as 20 to 30 percent overall. Wow. So clearly the demand for materials it has, has decreased as a result of that. But the, the uh, flip side of that is that domestic suppliers able to capitalize on the tariffs that were implemented in the last year or so, whether that be the steel tariffs, other, other tariffs that have been put in place on materials that impact the construction process. Domestic suppliers started ramping up their production. Distributors of materials began building up inventories as a result, and they were able to capitalize on that. According to Joe Pirro at Gilbane, uh, this actually enabled most local or regional distributors to get ahead of any of the restrictions on mo movement of materials across states. So as a result, we're not seeing as much of a delay there and, and as much of a lag in availability there. But I, one of the, the caveats with that is th these inventories that have been built up won't last forever. And that might starting to, to be consumed fairly quickly. And we have the potential for some real challenges ahead as job sites starts to ramp up again once um, restrictions start to be eased. And we start to see construction activity starting to return to more of a not necessarily a normal pace, but a, a stronger pace than where it's currently at. Mike Bellman, the Associated Builders and Contractors, I, I spoke with him as well in a, a podcast interview, also available on forconstructionpros.com. And he indicated there is the risk that distributors and their suppliers won't be able to keep up with the demand. And I'd like to share some of his comments from that podcast interview here in this clip. But with regards to the supply chain, we're working through the inventories and we're starting to see that if we don't get all the supply chain back up and running, we're, we're, we think we're going to start having some impact. So when we talk about reopening America and really trying to get back in shape with regards to construction and get it back to where the economy will support whatever it will support, a concern that we have is we're going to need to kickstart manufacturing, we think, a little bit earlier uh, than we may construction just so that there's a fluid, continuous flow of work. Light fixtures is an example. Uh, glass uh, is an example. Uh, so, you know, we're starting to see, you know, maybe some little bit of issues. And of course, then with regards to supply chain, personal protective equipment. Do we have enough masks? Do we have enough wash stations? Do we have enough hygiene facilities? that we've really upped the game on to make sure that people can wash their hands and do all the things that we need to do to meet the CDC guidelines. Sarah, what are you hearing in terms of this particular situation? Are you hearing concerns there with the manufacturers about being able to keep up with demand once the doors start to open again? We are, yeah. So in AEM's survey that they just released, they said demand for heavy equipment is down due to everything and contractors being shut down and or not working as much or having as much income. Same for you know farmers and a lot of the equipment markets were already kind of struggling at the beginning of the year, especially. But even on the supplier side, you know, HDMA mentioned that in addition to the like border issues with suppliers, like those that are here in the U.S. are just kind of using up their supply, but it's uncertain as to what's going to happen once they burn through those inventories. Are they going to be able to have ramped up production again to fulfill? Many companies are looking at alternate sources for getting supplies, but that's also been a little bit difficult, uh, HDMA said, because depending on how the virus has spread in various areas and 
the differentiation between international and domestic shelter in place orders and just it's so widespread the differentiation that it's hard to say how they're gonna if and how and if they're gonna be able to get certain supplies. So HMA said that about 78% of its members who were recently uh, surveyed are developing new supply chain plans, which they'll likely continue once this is all over because supply, that's always been something that companies have had to kind of look at and focus on. I recently spoke with uh, the president of Stark Manufacturing, Rachel Mize, to get an idea of how they've been continuing to work and manufacture products throughout all of this. And she did mention some aspects about how they're working with their suppliers at the moment. So we'll show a quick clip of that and then the full video can be found at oemoffhighway.com. Most of our supply chain is located in North America. We had, you know, in fact, this in January with China being shut down, you know, Lunar New Year and then it extended for the coronavirus. We had a few hiccups, not too bad, but then once it started infiltrating Europe and North America, We've had a few issues here and there. We have, if at all possible, we have a redundant suppliers for products, but being in our industry, everything is custom engineered. Mm -hmm. um, we're pretty vertically integrated, so we do a lot of machining in-house. So those things where we may not be able to get a component from a supplier, often we can come up with a contingency plan to keep that supply going. Uh, but it is, it's a, you know, something that you may update and check once a week. We're checking two times a day. Um, one of the things I'd like to, to kind of back up to, Mike Bellman uh, did bring, uh, with ABC, did bring us kind of an important point at the end of that audio clip that we played here is the availability of personal protective equipment. One of the biggest challenges that we're here is actually the ability to, to access PPE and meet the, the CDC guidelines on construction sites. And this is, um, according to Joe Pirro at Gilvane, um, this is one of the biggest indirect material challenges that is taking place right now. It's the ability to mass, sanitizing wipes, hand sanitizers, etc., to ensure that workers are, are safe on job sites. We're hearing it's actually, in some cases, delaying or halting projects due to supply shortages because they, they aren't able to meet CDC guidelines for safety equipment. Are you hearing anything along those lines also in the, the manufacturing sector? Because I, I have to believe that this is only going to be a problem that becomes compounded later on because one of the things that Joe Pirro mentioned is that there globally, there are very limited supplies of um, things such as N95 masks. And the fact that there is not a lot of opportunity to switch suppliers, to, to be able to leverage that availability of different It's really kind of hamstrung a lot of different market sectors. Yeah, it's, it's a concern for manufacturers as well, is what we've heard. You know, they need to keep their employees safe, and many of them are still in operation. It might be reduced hours and shifts, but they still are, many of them supply to essential industries like trucking and agriculture. So they need to keep working to an extent and keep their employees safe. So that is a concern. And HDMA mentioned that many of their member companies noted that in their recent survey. And I know many manufacturers have made donations to the healthcare industry because the PPE supplies are extremely necessary for those people, but some of them have also mentioned, you know, they need to, they're only donating from their own inventory of PPE what they feel they can because they need to keep their employees safe as well. So I think it'll be an ongoing right. issue. Yeah, and, and it is interesting because we have heard of a number of different manufacturers who have shifted their production over to producing things like face masks and other safety apparel, uh, other products that can help both the medical field, but also to help their own industry and industries like the construction industry as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a lot of manufacturers that have 
we've heard about everybody from Cummins to JCB and just it's it's almost every day there's somebody so that will hopefully help but the I know the need is just so great that and they can, some of them can only do so much so right and that's something that um, we will touch upon I think in future episode yeah. future episode the, the importance of what needs to take place in order for industries to be able to move forward as we start to see the COVID-19 pandemic hopefully stem in the near future. But there will be some changes that will need to take. I know there was, we had some recent news from a market analysis company about some thoughts on how manufacturers could implement certain safety procedures going forward and gave some insights. And uh, Purdue University has a working paper for manufacturers on it at the moment and some best practices or thoughts on how to keep employees safe and continue to produce product as we start to slowly come through all of this. And of course, um, we'll continue to report on this and provide as much guidance as we can and and resources uh, to both construction industry as well as to the manufacturing industry on forconstructionpros.com and oemoffhighway.com. Thank you, Sarah, for joining me in this discussion. In our final segment, we'll learn more about the effects of shelter in place on the movement of construction materials and equipment from Equipment Today's Kurt Benink. Hi, this is Kurt Benink. Like most industries, the transport of construction goods has been impacted by the current pandemic. Many types of construction activity throughout the United States and Canada have been deemed essential, and trucking is vital to keeping those operations working. According to data from Caterpillar, Trucks can carry approximately 71% of all the freight in the United States and nearly all bulk construction materials, such as roofing, lumber, and concrete. This flow of construction materials to the job site continues during the crisis. While loads for medical supplies and food supplies have been exempted from hours of service regulations and certain weight restrictions have been increased, trucks hauling construction supplies still need to abide by the previous existing regulatory requirements regarding time on duty and maximum weights. Moving larger pieces of construction equipment often requires over-dimensional permits, which can be a challenge in the current environment. These permits are administered by individual states and each state may have a different response on how they're handling the permit process during the pandemic. Some of the offices are closed with workers handling their request while working from home offices. It is best to plan ahead and contact the states or Canadian provinces in which you wish to travel. The Federal Highway Administration lists the contacts for each state on their website. To keep trucks on the road, an ample supply of CDL licensed drivers are critical, but the shelter in place orders have made renewal of CDLs and the associated medical cards all but impossible. In response, States have extended CDL and medical card expiration dates. However, this does not address the potential supply of new drivers who are having a difficult time getting tested. Some CDL training schools have been sidelined and the ability for drivers to get tested by the DMV varies by state. Some states require students to schedule a test ahead of time. For a list of individual state CDL and medical waivers, as well as current CDL testing status, visit the American Trucking Association's webpage. While construction equipment and materials continue to flow across international and state lines, some states have tried to slow the spread of COVID-19 at their borders. This has reportedly created delays and headaches when transporting materials long distances. States, such as Utah, require drivers to complete COVID-19 paperwork, which can be done electronically, but only while stopped. As long as the driver reports no symptoms, the delays are not long, according to Scott Hazelton, IHS Market. Truck repairs have also been impacted by the current COVID-19 crisis. In order to keep trucks on the road, you need 24-hour access to service facilities for necessary repairs and access to parts. While the major truck manufacturers idled production facilities in mid-March to protect production employees, the flow of parts for servicing existing trucks continued with no shortages being reported. 
The truck manufacturers have returned to protect employees from COVID-19 exposure. Service is an area where we are seeing some dealerships make some adjustments to address declining demand. With less business operating and many projects being placed on hold, there simply are fewer trucks on the road, which translates to less business in the repair shops. In response, many dealerships have adjusted weekend hours. In some cases, you may need to make an appointment for repairs on Saturday nights or Sundays. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, major truck OEMs had embarked on a transformation of the truck service experience. Telematics data was being used by rapid response centers to diagnose issues remotely and inform local service centers of issues before the trucks arrive. Electronic check-ins and expedited diagnosis of the trucks as they entered the dealership were being implemented to cut dwell time, the time between the truck entering the shop and the time it leaves. Many manufacturers had recently cut days off dwell time, with many offering dedicated bays to trucks requiring repairs of a couple hours or less. So most major service centers were operating more efficiently prior to the crisis. For fleets with their own service departments, avoiding trips to the dealership for parts while minimizing contact with people outside of your shop makes sense. Manufacturers have really stepped up with their online part systems. For instance, under the COVID-19 working conditions, Volvo Trucks North America is encouraging customers to utilize Volvo Select Part Store, the company's e-commerce parts platform, replacing in-person transactions with the convenience of online ordering and direct delivery. To learn more, we talk to Todd Shakespeare, Director of Parts Marketing, Volvo Trucks North America. You guys have more of a contactless delivery system for your parts. How does it help with, you know, preventing people from having to go in the dealerships to be able to get parts delivered at their doorstep? You know, I mean, certainly right now, social distancing is is the word of the day. So, you know, being able to go onto the select platform, identify the parts you need by the VIN that you're looking for, place that order with your dealer, ask for a touch-free delivery or pickup service uh, is is paramount right now. I mean, we're seeing uh, customers really appreciating that that service. So, you know, some other factors to mention, it's tied right into that dealer's inventory. So, like I mentioned, they can identify the part they need. So, they enter in the VIN to the truck that they've got. It brings up all of the main components. If they're looking for brakes, they can simply click on brakes and identify the, the part check availability, check their specific pricing, and place the order without having to have a face-to-face interaction at all. Uh, You know, you can't forget the 24-7 access. So, you know, if they're working more spread out shifts to have social distancing at the customer facilities, they can place an order at 11 at night or three in the morning uh, and know that they can get it. And, And in a lot of cases, it's actually quicker and easier than having to go into the dealership and and interact with a person. So, um, you know, it was picking up steam before for sure. Uh, This situation, as difficult as it is, uh, has actually shown the value even more to, I think, our customers and even our dealers. Okay, now, can any customer order parts to your online Volvo Select Parts store or only certain customers allowed to order parts? Let's start with the ultimate answer is yes, but it's not an online marketplace. So when a customer is interested in utilizing the select platform, they can request either to their facing dealer or through the Volvo Trucks website, put in a request for access. And then the dealer of record will give them a user ID and they can then set up their own password. And from that moment on, they've got access. And if they own Volvo Trucks, they can obviously submit that list of VINs and then they will also have access to those parts just for the trucks that they own. But certainly we don't want other customers seeing other customers' vehicles. So um, it's a request access, the dealer grants rights, and then you're up and running. Process takes usually less than 48 hours. Now, you know, in trucking, timing is everything. So how mm-hmm. long does it typically take to get parts delivered? And have you seen any delays due to to the current crisis? Have there been any parts delay deliveries? We tie our customers to the dealer in their area of record. So we know geographically they're going to be close together. That's our way of going to market is is through our dealer body. 
We know that the lead time from dealer to customer is usually short. We talked earlier, the customer can come pick it up, stop in the parking lot, flash their headlamps, call the dealer and have somebody bring the parts out right now while we're dealing with the virus so that they don't have to have the face-to-face. A delivery driver can bring the part to the customer and leave it outside of the bay doors. We can use small package shipping like FedEx or UPS if necessary. I would say generally you're talking same day delivery as long as the order is is given to the dealer by let's call it 2 p.m. Um, worst case it would be next day. We have not from a dealer perspective our fill rates at a dealer are, are 93 percent. You know when you add our seven distribution centers into it now you're up at the 96 percent mark. Uh, we really have not seen any degradation in supply chain yet due to this virus so the customers are still getting the parts they need when you need them in a timely manner. How about market trends in terms of customer acceptance of Volvo Select? Have you seen an increase since this crisis hit? It's a little too early to see it in volumes going on, but what we have seen is an increase in training requests, both from dealers to us. So how do we teach our customers to use this tool? And then also new customers coming on asking their dealers to train them on the platform, you know, the how do I identify a part? How do I look at it? So the trends that I'm seeing point to increased adoption and therefore increased use over the past month. And that was another question I was going to follow up with is, do you, do you think this will create a fundamental shift in the way people order parts? Do you think you're, this is really going to drive people more to online parts ordering? Absolutely. I, I think even before the coronavirus, we were already seeing that transition. I mean, when we look at our retail marketplace, I mean, many of us were already converting from brick and mortar to your to your Amazon type of, of facilities. We're seeing the exact same thing in the transportation industry with that conversion happening slowly but surely. So I do believe this will speed that up most likely. You know, there's a technical aspect to these trucks that's different than retail. So you'll always need that ability to contact somebody at the dealer for those more technical questions and issues. But but yes, we, we had already witnessed the transition and, and this certainly won't slow it down. I think if anything, we'll see it we'll see it speed up over the next few years. Now in ter- terms of dealerships, does this actually make the dealership more efficient by working through Volvo Slack than having people come into the dealership and order absolutely i mean when you when you think about uh the time a counter person has to take when that call comes in and think of it for the more simplistic things you know a a need for batteries or brakes something that the customer either a already knows the part number that they want or b can look it up fairly easily themselves this allows the front counter people to focus more on those technical calls that really do require the expertise of the dealer and allow those simpler calls to flow through the e-commerce channel. So um, it's really been a value add. It's reduced the wait times of the customers when they're contacting the dealers. It's made the dealerships more efficient. When the order is placed by the customer, it automatically feeds into the dealer as a pick ticket. So the warehouse personnel can very quickly grab that pick ticket, pull the parts either for local pickup or delivery, depending on what the customer needs. So absolute efficiency gains at the dealership through, through the process. Now, if I own a fleet of trucks and I'm going to order parts, how am I yep. sure I'm getting the right parts? Does that work by VIN number or how does that work to make sure you're getting the right parts for your truck? You know, we, we've got two channels. So so channel one, yes, is, is your VIN. So I've, I've got a Volvo vehicle. I can load my VIN. You've got a link right to what we call our impact catalog okay. from the uh, part select site. So they can type that VIN in. They can find the components they want. They can add it to a shopping cart, check pricing and availability and place the order. We've also got, let's call them commodity items or or all makes items, depending on what terminology you want to use. So in this case, customer can find the components they want via supplier catalogs, dealer catalogs. So maybe it's a battery and they know they want 650 cold cranking amps. They can identify that through a supplier website, then go onto the part select store, check pricing and availability and place the order. So really it's it's those two channels are the way to find the component you want and probably place the order. Now, if you're just ordering the stock maintenance parts, is it more efficient to bulk order a certain amount of parts or do you charge delivery for individual small items or how does that work? Yeah, you know, when you're talking dealer to customer, it's really a dealer decided. Most of our dealers do not charge a local delivery fee. If the customer needs it like an overnight service or something, of course, the freight charge to us will will be passed on. 
there are some volume discount opportunities. So certainly if you're a large fleet and you know that you're using a large number of product A, you know, to order that in, in a larger package quantity or larger shipment uh, has has some opportunity from a cost point. So then you just got to balance was was the larger order a three month supply and the holding cost worth the discount. And, and we work with the customers and the dealers to make sure they make the best choice for them. One of the last questions I have here, I realize a lot of the manufacturers shut down for a while from March until, you know, coming back online now in May. Um, has yeah. it affected parts availability at all? Or do you, do you, you said you don't currently see any parts disruption or has the parts continued to flow during this whole process? Yeah, I, I couldn't be more proud of the Volvo employees and the supply chain. I mentioned earlier, we have seven distribution centers located throughout the U.S. and Canada. Every single one of them has stayed open uh, throughout this whole thing, delivering parts to our dealers. We are an essential industry, and it's important that we keep these trucks up and running, and they've done a fantastic job. Let's go one step back in the supply chain and look at the supply base. Uh, first, I'm going to focus on powertrain parts. That's the lifeblood of our vehicles. So our engines, our automatic manual transmissions, our carriers, our driveline components, all of those have stayed uh, really strong from an availability perspective. Our remanufacturing centers did have to shut down for a period of time. We were able to pre-build and now we're starting to build again. So powertrain wise, those those parts that keep those trucks really up and running, uh, we haven't haven't lost a step on. And then when you look at our other suppliers, they've done a fantastic job. All of them, for the most part, have been able to get those essential business approvals. The only area of concern, I would say, right now is Mexico. Mexico has not been as free to give the approval for an essential business. Most of our suppliers that have operations in Mexico luckily also have some level of operations in the state. So we've been able to keep availability strong, but the Mexico situation is probably the only risk I see. And my understanding right now is end of May, they should be starting to open back up. So if that's the case, we're going to be able to flow through this thing with really no disruptions. Okay. Is there anything about Volvo Select that I haven't touched upon that you think is important to relay to the customers out there? You know, Volvo Trucks was was first to market with an e-commerce solution. Many years ago, Part Select came up. We've continued to modify it and adjust it to meet the needs of the customer. And I think your 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 readers can know that Volvo has great things on the horizon. We are not done. Uh, we're fully committed to the e-commerce marketplace. Uh, and we know, as we spoke about earlier, that this will be the future, the brick and mortar tied to the electronic marketplace. And they can expect to see some great things out of Volvo trucks in the coming months and years. Thank you, Kurt. That's it for this episode of Transportation Chain. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in for our next episode as we take an even deeper look into the effects of COVID-19 on transportation, trucking, and supply chain management. Until next time.